Hello, welcome to Walk in the Park. My name is Tony Ingram, and this is episode 138 on May 18th, first showing on public access television in Ithaca, New York, Pegasus Studios, on May 19th, starting at 9 p.m. You can go to my blog and uh, see all of my uh, episodes and also the schedule for the cable cast for Walk in the Park for this week. Going to run into next week. So, um, okay, this week we're going to go several places. We're going to start off at Ithaca Falls, and then we're going to go talk about Cayuga Lake and it'll be a continuation of a uh, presentation that we had last, started off last week. I'll get to that in a minute. And then we're going to go over to Watkins Glen State Park and take a look at some of the changes that have taken place in that park, actually over uh, maybe a century and a half or so. So uh, first we'll start off with a little clip of Ithaca Falls last week. So Ithaca Falls, as we all know, is um, one of the biggest waterfalls in the Cayuga Lake watershed, and uh, it's in Fall Creek, which is the largest sub-watershed of Cayuga Lake. It's some 140 square miles. So uh, we'll be getting into talking about the Cayuga Lake watershed in a few minutes. Let's take a look at this aerial photograph. Can you see Ithaca Falls just to the lower left of center there? And that's the Fall Creek Gorge going on the north side of most of the Cornell campus. And uh, this picture was taken by my friend Bill Hecht, who likes to fly around Cayuga Lake at different times of the year and take aerial photographs. So uh, this gives a good perspective showing it coming from East Hill and then pouring off the steep side of the Cayuga Valley and in downtown Ithaca. Let's uh, go up onto Stewart Avenue Bridge and look down at the top of Ithaca Falls, and then looking beyond, Fall Creek courses across um, the city of Ithaca, the downtown area that used to be marshlands a couple hundred years ago, into Cayuga Lake. So there it is. It's part of Cayuga Lake. And then we'll get up in another of Bill's pictures here, and uh, Fall Creek enters Cayuga Lake there. Now, in the lower part of the picture, you see a little bit of uh, a green belt area. They're going from the lower right and then angling up to the left. That's Cascadilla Gorge going through between Cornell Campus and College Town, which would be on the bottom left in Cornell Campus lower center. And then if you look up to the center, just the beginning of Cayuga Lake there, the flat end of it, if you go a little left of center, you can see a little stream coming into the lake. That is Fall Creek that has come from, from uh, Ithaca Falls. Now, if you look at the Cornell Campus just below center in the lower right, um, above that, it's green. Well, in that area, that's where Fall Creek and Ithaca Falls is, of course. Okay, so um, so now you can see much of Cayuga Lake snaking to the north, 38 miles. A lot of people think it's a straight lake, but actually it's kind of a zigzag lake. And um, in fe February 27th, the Cayuga Lake Watershed Network met with uh, at the... Um, U.S. Coast Guard Auxiliary Station on Cayuga Inlet, along with a number of uh, representatives of other groups, um, to have a workshop called Caring for Cayuga. We started to look at that, a portion of that, last week, but we only had a few minutes. So I'm going to start that section over again, talking about the Cayuga Lake Watershed, Cayuga Lake Watershed Network, 
and uh, also the Cayuga Lake floating classroom, and then some of the issues uh, like invasive species and other uh, impacts and issues, environmental issues um, affecting Cayuga Lake and things that we need to watch out for or to address. So we're going to go right to that, um, that talk. Caring for Cuba, that's what we're here today, to learn about taking care of the lake. Um, I talked to you now about hemlock yeah, woolly adelgid, there, uh, uh, I'm sorry about hydrilla, and there are other invasives that we're concerned about, there are other issues of course. Um, oh God, it's going to start doing this. Um, so that was my organization, let's see if I can fight it back, yep. The Cuba Lake <coughs> Watershed Network, that's me. Um, this is Bill's uh, floating classroom. The Cuba Lake Watershed Network has got um, a <coughs> membership. We have a board of directors. We've got Mike Duttweiler here from our board of directors. And uh, we've been around for about 16, 17 years doing a lot of different things. And um, Bill, maybe you could tell people briefly about the origin of the floating classroom and what you do? Okay, well, um, let's see, what can I add to that? It's moving right ahead. Yes, I'll, I'll, I'll kick it back. Um, floating classroom's been around for, for quite a while, and actually I want, I want to plug the Restoration Protection Plan. I will. Because, uh, yeah, I know, I know Hillary will, and, and right now we are, you know, there is a, a process of updating. There is a watershed management plan for Cuba Lake that has not been especially in heavy use in the last 10 years, but it was originally developed in, in about 2000. I guess it was formally adopted in 2002. And out of that plan came a recognized desire for education. So there were some people that very doggedly uh, um, pursued the idea of having an educational vessel on the lake. And, and Captain Dennis Montgomery actually purchased the, the handle, which is the boat we work off of, and brought it onto the lake for that purpose. So since that time, the floating classroom has existed in various ways, and I guess about six years ago, we started making it a little bit more legitimate. So at this point, we take out about uh, between 1,500 and 2,000 students each year out of the lake. Um, and we also run a, a, a program in the winter where students raise trout and then learn about streams and release them to streams. And the whole idea is, can we educate students of all ages about this resource, this water resource that supports our communities and, and our lives. Um, so they'll be better equipped to make decisions in the future. Uh, and that's, that's what we're about. And you know, we try to provide a couple of platforms that are exciting and engaging um, that wouldn't be there otherwise. And that's the boat and our, our trout tanks. <coughs> and you've also seen them at the end of the, the dock uh, at the uh, farmer's market where they give lots of wonderful tours all um, season long. And that's it for boat tours. So we, we charge, we work closely with them, and that's a private business mm -hmm. that does the boat tours. Okay. Well, let me just see what I've got in here. See it's how I did this without a lot of sleep. So, um, briefly, what's a Cuba Lake watershed? Some people are very scared with words like that. It's all the land that drains to the lake. What's that mean? Well, the big map is back there. If you want to get up close and personal with it, it's on our website. But um, each one of those slightly different hued greens is a different uh, creek. And um, of course, you know, the other Finger Lakes are not just floating in, in limbo. They each have their own watersheds with their own creeks draining. It's 870 square miles of land, creeks, and lake. Uh, that also includes six counties if you follow some of the headwater streams into uh, Schuyler and Cortland County, three counties on the uh, lake itself, Seneca, Cayuga, and Tompkins at the bottom, uh, and 43 villages, towns, cities. So it's a, it's a complex mixture of the natural systems of the creeks and the human grid that we've overlaid on it's it. It's the largest watershed in the Finger Lakes too. And um, so I just have a few beautiful pictures here by Bill Hecht, uh, a flying <coughs> photo 
wonderful guy who takes all these pictures of all of the lakes and then just gives them away for people to use and enjoy. So of course that's Taganic down at the bottom. And uh, wonderful picture taken in, in early autumn. Um, then this is an older picture taken by Bill, I think, from the north end looking south. Now we Ithacans don't usually have this perspective. Um, Montezuma Wildlife Refuge there, the old um, railroad line, and then looking south towards um, fabulous Ithaca in the distance uh, with uh, Seneca County on the right side and Kiwi County on the left side of the picture. And then this is a beautiful picture, just evocative, taken by Michael Deneen of the Sheldrake area a few summers ago. Um, and then just to remind us, at the other end, there's all these creeks that create that lake. This is uh, buttermilk. These are the headwater valley, uh, one of the headwaters valleys of Six Mile Creek up in Brighton. This is Irish Settlement Road. Oh, uh, uh. And then, of course, the, uh, the, the bigger picture. This is the Finger Lakes, Lake Ontario. Um, and this is sort of how it breaks down in terms of some numbers. 37 major creeks drain to Cuba Lake. And then there's, there's hundreds more of those little straight creeks. Oh, just don't do that. And 65% of the total amount of water, of surface water, that flows into Cuba Lake comes from the big creeks at the southern end of the lake. So we're, we're really responsible. We're the stewards down here in Tompkins County for um, over half of the water that goes into the lake. So, you know, it behooves us that it be of high quality. Um, Cuba Lake is 34 miles long, 430 feet deep. Now, I guess it's longer than Seneca, but a lot less deep, because Seneca is sort of the big primeval beast. It's 690, right, feet deep? It's, it's, it's really 660, even though. Okay. But it's, uh, so it's uh, a bigger beast than we are in terms of, of water. Um, and then this is just, um, I've been steward or executive director of the Cuba Lake Watershed Network now since 2009, and we've seen some issues come and go. Um, but this is a list of some of the challenges facing the Cuba Lake Watershed. Invasive species, hydrilla. Uh, Woolly adelgid, the round goby, the water chestnut, and then I put in parentheses hydraulic fracturing, fracking, because for the time being we have a, what we call the ban in New York State on fracking um, that doesn't prevent infrastructure such as pipelines and associated projects from rolling across our region. So it's not like it went away and the gas is still in the ground and somebody may come back looking for it again sometime. So that's, uh, that'll, it's still on the list. Um, and then there are the, the, the big battles going on over fossil fuel versus renewable energy choices and what kind of future we'll have here and how that will affect air and water quality. And then there are the, the legacy pollutants of Cuba Lake. Um, you know, every, every town around the lake had a little old informal dump before it got, we got into scientific landfilling. And those are all still there, and a lot of them are just sort of ignored. And then there are various industrial legacies, some of which we know about here in Ithaca. And there's the GE plant um, that's managing to pull water in two directions. Up in the Auburn area, uh, there's some old industrial sites on the Seneca Cuba Canal and some other places that, that bear watching. Um, there's concern about the possible contamination of Cuba Lake from the uh, coal combustion waste landfill at the Cuba AES coal fired power plant and so on. So, you know, it, it's Cuba Lake is about in the middle in terms of quality. It's not, it's not as spectacularly clean as Skinny Atlas. Um, it doesn't have the ongoing um, problems of, of pollution that Owasco Lake to our east have. It's, there's a professor at uh, 
Hobart William Smith, uh, Professor Halfman, who kind of does a, a survey of all the lakes every summer. And, and it's, uh, it's not an in-depth survey, but he says, you know, he's got a sort of report of how the lakes are doing. And Cougar Lake's right in the middle. It's not the most clean. It's not, not the least clean. But we have to, you know, keep on track here. And then uh, runoff impacts from farming uses and overdevelopment of the lake shore. People who put too much fertilizer on their lawns and then it rains and runs into the lake. Oops, that causes problems. And then we've got these new elements of climate change, <coughs> extreme weather events, all the storm water um, that we are not ready to handle. And then there are the emerging contaminants, like microbeads uh, in your scrubbers for your face, and your toothpaste, and uh, then things like the pharmacy, realizing that the pharmaceuticals that we consume, the caffeine that we consume, one way or another, some of that may be getting into our water. And uh, the Ithaca area waste treatment plant is doing some really good new monitoring programs and testing to see how much of a problem those emerging contaminants are. So um, just to get to invasives for a minute, this is um, water chestnut, uh, a charming, really rather pretty plant. You see it there on the upper <coughs> left. Um, but it, it again can take over a water body very quickly. It's a real problem in some of the, uh, along uh, Lake Ontario shoreline and in a lot of places to the north. And there are water, uh, water lake associations where people, you know, go out and spend many days each summer rooting this stuff out. Um, and we don't want to have to do that here. But uh, a big patch of it was found uh, in the, north, um, the northwest corner of the lake in the Canoga Creek area last summer. And um, the uh, Seneca County people went out with, you can sort of see the machine at the back of the picture, and removed it. But uh, this... Okay, that's all I have of that um, talk right now. So um, I'll be continuing uh, pieces or segments of that workshop in future episodes. But right now we're going to go over to Watkins Glen State Park. And um, there have been some changes over there. So let's take a look here. Let's go over to Seneca Lake. And uh, Seneca is, uh, as Hillary Lambert mentioned, has the most water in it. It's the deepest of the Finger Lakes. And look at the, uh, so we're looking down, it's another Bill Heck picture here, looking down on the village of Watkins Glen at the south end of Seneca Lake. And then the lower left, that dark area, that is the gorge of Watkins Glen. So um, we're going to go and fly around and look at it from the, from the east. Just have to adjust the volume here a little bit. And um, so we're looking right into the gorge and right where you would drive into the park there and then down on the ground in the gorge. Now this is not how the gorge looks today. There's been a lot of changes that have been going on in the main entrance and in fact the state of New York has gotten, uh, um, the state parks have gotten several million dollars that they're going to really um, refurbish the entire main entrance of the park. So it's going to be really, uh, really a lot of improvements. And I'll show you some of the things that have already happened in a minute. So uh, let's, this is what the entrance looked like maybe five years ago and for quite a long time before that. This is the, this is the end of the entrance to the gorge. See, we go in here, just the back of what you can see there, the all far upper left, uh, is the end of the entrance entrance amphitheater they used to call it back in the 1800s the main entrance of the gorge so you'd park in there and then at the the um, rear you'd uh, walk up this ramp into the entrance tunnel and that would come out um, you go through the tunnel and it actually bends around to the left and goes over that bridge over that waterfall called entrance cascade and the bridge is called Sentry Bridge so this is what it looked like back oh a hundred years ago and it was not a stone uh, bridge there. There was a concrete bridge, and there wasn't a ramp. There was a um, set of steps, concrete steps, 
let's go even farther than that back into the 1800s and here they had a staircase up there with a wooden bridge and there wasn't any tunnel so now we're going to uh, go to a um, short video that I took actually last week just showing one of uh, some of the things that have changed since then and then I'll explain them once we get back to Okay, so that's what it looked like last week, um, and we ended up with um, a, a picture of, uh, well, actually that was the, um, a tunnel going through the cliff beyond the bridge, the footbridge, Century Bridge. That tunnel predates the park, in, frac in fact, comes from uh, uh, before the Civil War when there was a, an operating mill. There were a couple of operating mills actually in the main entrance to the gorge. And back then it was uh, called Mill Creek, and um, what was it called? Um, it was a gully, something like that. I can't remember the name of it. But anyway, it wasn't Watkins Glen until until after it became a resort. So here's a mill, and then this is a, an artist conception. This is drawn by Ithaca artist uh, Francis Fawcett. And there was a flume that came from the gorge, from that hole through the cliff that was under the bridge now, that came down through on this uh, flume trough and ran an overshot wheel in the mill. And this was a plaster mill and made plaster. So this is an old photograph from back in the 1860s showing the remnants of that flume trough coming out of the gorge. And then just up around the bend from the um, uh, flume tr uh, trough, from that hole in the cliff, there was this little dam that dammed up the first section of the gorge beyond the main entrance. And this is what it looks like today. And um, this was dammed up, and so in fact, they, even the old days, they called it uh, Stillwater Gorge because of this little dam. But that was eventually taken out. So here's another picture here showing a staircase built up into the gorge and then a footbridge, which predates the stone footbridge and the concrete footbridge. And you can still see remnants of the flume trough structure 
uh, going off to the right there. So there was a period of transition from this being uh, a um, source of water power and being a scenic resort. It's in what they call Big Gully, I guess it was before. And here's the mill looking from those uh, wooden structures. This would have been in the 1860s. The mill was, was torn down. I think they had a fire at some point, but it was torn down by the end of the 1860s. And there are some folks down there at the bottom you can see were clearly tourists and not mill workers. So um, in this picture, the um, flume trough is gone. So um, once again, we're walking the park, walkinthepark.tv. Let's go take a look at um, some other pictures. Here's uh, the entrance also back in the 1800s. This is 1906, so it's still all wooden entrances. But And then this is looking back from back in that period. The mill is gone in the late 1800s from these wooden structures looking back. And then there's a ticket gate down there. And then people actually could get to that flume hole and walk in there. And you can see there's a little bit of a, a rickety railing, a little wooden railing there on the right. In 1908, the, uh, between 1906 and 1908, the state park was created and they built the original stone uh, concrete bridge and other structures in the gorge. This is looking back to the main entrance area from that old concrete era. Um, and this is up in the tunnel. This is actually a modern picture, people climbing up into the tunnel to the bridge. And then looking from beyond the bridge, you can see this is, this is the Century Bridge from the other side looking out of the gorge. You can see that there is a pathway and railing that goes over to the tunnel again, the flume tunnel, and then that's entrance cascade to the left of it. So uh, that was uh, all destroyed by a great flood in 1935, and you can see on the right, perhaps, you can see the um, entrance tunnel and the staircase to it was completely washed out. And that had to be rebuilt. So we ended up having uh, this replace it, and the stonework replacing the um, concrete bridge. And now, over the last few years, they've been creating a new walkway up from the, near the creek, look where, where you have the overlook to the uh, entrance cascade. And here's some of the uh, masonry work that was going on. And then finally, what we have today. And there's going to be a lot more happening in the main entrance. And the uh, uh, cars will be moved across the street and so forth. So that's, uh, that's all I've got for you today. So uh, we'll um, do some more at Watkins Glen at some other times. So anyway, thanks for joining me, and we'll see you again soon.